Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Uh, my name is Alexander, and I greet you on behalf of the 2025 initiative, Preparing the Way, on our Virgo Solar Festival webinar. And we will begin our work today with a short alignment. So let's align within, connecting with own soul. And we visualize souls joining our meeting today, our work today from around the world as sparks of light. And we connect together, linking our hearts and minds. And we connect in the group centers. Which we visualize as a beam of bright light. And we recollect the purpose of the 2025 initiative to globally support contribution of world servers, preparing the way for the externalization of the hierarchy and the reappearance of the Christ. In our consciousness, we enter in the periphery of the ashram. Linking our group heart center with the heart center of the hierarchy the Christ. We align with the triangle of Shambhala hierarchy, humanity. Keeping the alignment, we refocus back in the group heart center and we begin our meeting in our service to humanity. I have an honor to uh, present you our guest uh, today, uh, Judy McAllister from Findhorn Foundation in Scotland. Uh, Judy? Yes. 
Hello. Hi. Thank you for joining us today. And um, we wait for your presentation and our collective work on creating this space for med meditation into which you will lead us at the end of our webinar. Thank you. So the Thank you. microphone is yours. Oh, it's all mine now. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you very much for um, this invitation and this opportunity. Um, this is a new experience for me in terms of uh, working in this kind of way. I'm much more accustomed to face-to-face -face and impersonal, um, in-person, sorry, <laughs> connections. So um, if I am a bit uh, faltering at first, I do hope that you will forgive me. Um, what I would like to do is begin almost immediately with um, a, a slideshow that I hope will give you an idea of what it is that we are trying to do over here. The Fintorn community celebrated its 50th birthday a couple of years ago so we've definitely been around for a while and we've learned a lot we've discovered a lot we've made a lot of mistakes and somehow out of all of that there is a very vibrant living community that is here in the north of Scotland so I'd like to start with that if I may I'd like to begin with these three uh, quotes. This first one is from Eileen Caddy, who's one of the original three founders and embodies in some ways one of the basic principles of our community here, which has to do with finding our own inner places of inspiration, of connection to the divine, and then acting from that place. This quote uh, is from Dorothy McLean, who is one of the other of the three main founders of the community. And indeed, it embodies this principle that nature is intelligent and that it is in our relationship with that intelligence that we can indeed be of service to the planet as a whole. And finally, this quote from David Spangler, who was and is um, a key and influential figure. He lived here in the 1970s and now lives in the United States and works with his own form of spiritual inquiry and, create and connection to the subtler worlds. We are located in the northeast of Scotland. Today it's rainy and cold and gray and autumn feels weeks early. And as you can see, we are located right on the coast. We are in fact located on a small peninsula. The peninsula is only about a mile, half a mile wide at this particular point. And this is the other main campus called Clooney Hill, which is located in Forest, not too far away. This really embodies the three founding spiritual principles of community here. Inner listening, working with the idea that each and all of us can create a direct connection with the divine and that through that we can move into a relationship with the intelligence within nature and create a co-creative relationship and partnership with those intelligences, with those aspects of the subtle worlds. And in doing these two things, we can then move into action that is inspired from an inner source, action that is inspired by a desire to be of service in the world. 
our intention, of course, is to live in harmony with one another and with the earth. And there's a lot of different ways that we do this. We are, in fact, a living and working community. Spirituality here is put into practice on a day-to-day -day basis in the ordinary things of life, in the way that you do the dishes, in the way that you begin your work. There are a lot of circles at Fintorn. We begin and end the working day with circles, with something we call an attunement, beginning in silence, aligning with the aspects of the subtle worlds that we are working with, aligning with one another, aligning with the overall purpose and direction of the community that we're a part of. And as with most communities, there is a spectrum of life here, from the very young to the more elderly and everything in between. We play together, or we watch each other play sometimes. But mostly we share silence in a variety of different spaces. There are a number of commun uh, community sanctuaries. Most people have a quiet space or even a room, a sanctuary in their own homes. And we begin our day in collective meditation. And meditation is built into the working day as well. Of course, given that there is now 52 years of history, um, I could spend probably the bulk of this seminar and several others just telling the story. So I hope you will forgive me for the brevity with which the story gets told. Our three founders had various spiritual paths of their own and came to Scotland, met each other in London in the 40s after the Second World War, and came to Scotland in 1957 where Peter was appointed the manager of the Clooney Hill Hotel here in Forres, where they worked quite successfully managing the hotel and indeed increasing its star ratings. However, several years later they were very abruptly fired, um, literally with only a few hours notice. And because that notice was so short, they had nowhere to go. And so they towed their small caravan onto the Findhorn Bay Caravan Park and were met with uh, gorse and broom and heathers and lots of rounded pebbles in sand. There really was no soil here. This really is a sand dune peninsula and that was where they found themselves. Expecting that there would be jobs to be found in the spring and continuing to follow their own inner direction. All of them had very strong and committed spiritual practices. They thought that they would find new work in the spring but that did not happen. And one morning in her meditation Dorothy was inwardly directed to make contact with the intelligence of nature having followed that inner direction for some 10 years at that point and having learned to trust it, she did indeed make the attempt and began that is how the journey of her connection with the intelligence of nature, what she called the, the Davic realms or the angelic realms, that's how it began. And it was really out of necessity 
in terms of trying to create the garden to feed their family and to feed the very small group of people that was becoming the community that the uh, advice and the input of this intelligence of nature was sought and through Dorothy it became a very active and practical as well as inspirational point of relationship. In the 1960s a man named R. Ogilvy Crombie also began to visit the community. Peter had met him while um, attending a conference in Edinburgh and Rock had the capacity to engage with the nature spirits, to commune and communicate with the elemental beings, the elven peoples, the various um, aspects of the subtle worlds to do with nature. In a very short space of time a garden was created literally on sand dunes. The garden began to produce extraordinary results. Probably we are most infamous for the, so, for the 40 pound cabbages that were said to have grown in those early days in the community. Unfortunately there weren't very many cameras in the community in those days so we don't actually have photographs but the youngsters who were part of the community in those days do often talk of the frequency of cabbage in the meals in their youth. Local experts as well as garden experts people from the Soil Association all came and could not explain what it was that they were witnessing in the garden and there were various um, comments made as to some X factor. It took a while for Peter and Eileen and Dorothy to really be willing to talk openly about that, what that X factor actually was. However, news of the garden got out and people began to visit and so very, very slowly a community came into being and in the late 60s buildings began to be built. Up until this time everyone was living in caravans. This was still a commercial caravan site and there was no thought particularly of creating community. Findhorn unlike a lot of communities these days was not really an intentional community in fact it was an accidental one one that came about because the people who were at the center of it had made a very strong commitment to following their inner direction to seeking a relationship with the divine and to being of service to that divine source the 70s were a decade of very rapid expansion. A number of different buildings were bought. The Finthorn Foundation as a charitable trust was created. There were the beginnings of laying the foundations for formal learning processes, for creating guest programs and workshops. The Experience Week, which is really our introductory program, it's a seven-day residential program, it was begun in the mid early, early to mid 70s and various other properties either came into our care as custodians or were gifted to the community. The 1980s, by the end of the 1970s the community had grown to 370, 380 people and then there was a, a quite, a, quite a mass exodus for various reasons at the end of the 70s and so we moved into the 80s a much leaner group of people. We were about 150 by then and yet there was a sense that it was time to become more permanent and for a number of reasons we took the decision to actually purchase the caravan park which was up until then simply where we were being tenants on someone else's land. So we purchased the caravan park and we began to create consciously a community that would go forward into the future. So the sense of building began. We put up a wind turbine, uh, 
the community, there was a community that began to grow up around the foundation. Not everybody that was attracted to this area because of the foundation wanted to live and work in the foundation. They had their own businesses, their own careers. Their, we had artists and craftspeople. We had um, various health practitioners, etc. And they kind of grew in a circle around the foundation so that there was a community and this organization called the foundation at the top, at the center of it. The, the parents got together and created a Steiner school. A nature sanctuary was built. Um, and there were the beginnings of beginning to build permanent homes. These ones were built from what were essentially large spirit receivers that were being made redundant in the whiskey industry. And so these whiskey vats began to be turned into houses. The 90s we began to be more structured. It felt like we were kind of growing up and we needed to begin to take ourselves and our service to the world in a different light and so various organizations began to be set up new homes were being built the foundation was granted a non-governmental organization status through the United Nations Findhorn was a founding member of the global eco village network we began to create uh, ecological innovations. One of them was the living machine, which is a sewage treatment system based on uh, ecologies, a series of ecologies that uh, clean the water and make it possible once again. Since the turn of the century, of course, we've put even more of our energy and attention into the value of living lightly or living with nature, and so more Eco buildings have been built. We have erected three more wind turbines to create a very large percentage of our electricity. We've established a college. We've established our own um, monetary system called the Eco. An ecological footprint study has been done that gave us a very um, credible rating. We had the lowest measurable ecological footprint at that time in the industrialized West. We installed a biomass boiler. We created an art center. We lost Eileen um, back in 2003. But the other remaining founder, Dorothy McLean, moved back to Findhorn, having left in 1973 to go out and do her work in the world. She moved back in 2009 and is still with us at the ripe old age of 94. So we've now had 50 plus years of transformation and these next few slides just are please forgive the the state of some of these slides um, like I said we didn't take a great deal of care in those days to record what we were doing but these give you some idea of the level of transformation of the environment that we've brought about from literally sand dunes and stone into a very ecologically diverse community with mature trees and gardens and a very lively ecosystem. These days uh, we are really a community of communities. There are overlapping circles, there are very complex organizational structures that allow all of these different communities and aspects of what is here to interact with one another. We have approximately 4,000 residential guests, that means 4,000 people who come and spend at least a week in residence here in the, in the foundation. We have approximately 5,000 people who come to visit for a few hours or a day in a year. 
Our guests come from approximately 60 different countries. We have 120 members of staff within the foundation and another 450 people, probably even a little bit more than that, who are part of the wider community. So we're a fairly substantial number of people in this little pocket in Scotland. We estimate that approximately 32,000 people have, have participated in the Experience Week, and that's the week-long residential introductory program that happens here, probably about 50, 48 to 50 weeks a year. Nearly every week we have an Experience Week going on, and it's the introductory program and the door through which if you wish to do further programs or stay more in the community then that's kind of the, the, the gateway or the doorway in. Meditation remains a very active part of our community life here. We have in people are encouraged to have an individual practice of one sort or another and there certainly is a multiplicity of disciplines and practices within the population of a community. But we do also have group meditations several times a day at set times. We gather in the sanctuaries, both at the campus at the park and the campus at Clooney Hill, for led meditations where we meditate together as a community. People are encouraged to develop their capacities to engage with their own inner wisdom, their own inner voice. Dorothy and Eileen and Peter were very happy to talk about the God within. Nowadays, of course, there are many other names that are also given to that inner space. The Divine Source, Limitless Love and Truth, the All, the Universal Truth. What we do share, however, is a commitment to engaging in a way that allows us to make that connection, regardless of how we name it or what particular face we might put on it. We have an active community life, living together, eating together, playing together, sometimes not getting along so well together, and then how we work with the not getting along so well becomes part of the practice of living in harmony with all life. We begin our working days and end our working days with something called an attunement, a time of silence where we stand in a circle or sit in a circle and hold hands more often than not and take time to align vertically, horizontally, inwardly and outwardly so that we can come from a place of focus and attention in whatever the work is that we're doing. It's also how we start our meetings, whether they're business meetings or social meetings. If we meet in the Universal Hall, which is our sort of social gathering space, performing arts building, there also our meetings, our gatherings, begin with moments of silence, of coming together and remembering what it is that we are really here to be doing. The intention to engage in service is kind of, it's intrinsic to the community here. It was very much a focus for Peter and Eileen and Dorothy. They created their own um, global network and did a whole series of meditations connecting with other centers, other light workers, creating what they called the network of light back in the 50s and 60s. We also engage in service very actively in terms of the community itself. So regardless of your background, regardless of what job you occupy, regardless of where you are in the community. You will take your turn to do the dishes. You will take your turn to clean bungalows on Saturday morning when we have our turnover of guests. Or you'll take your turn to do night porter rounds and lock up at night or to drive buses. So we also engage very actively in how we serve one another to create community. always looking for ways to live lightly on the land 
and engaging with something called our Common Ground document, which I hope I'll be able to come to at a later point. These are just some of the programs that are part of how we begin, how people come into the community, if they want to come and do programs as part of the um, educational stream within the community. These were, would be some of the things that they would do. And I'll give you some links later for the web pages and the brochure. And We also do a variety of workshops. Most weeks there are two or three, sometimes even four, other kinds of workshops or events going on beyond the basic programs. Sorry about that. We do conferences and events um, a couple of times a year. A year we will have a big conference or some kind of special event. We have a, a very large event coming up later on this year called the New Story Summit. And again, I'm hoping I can give you some further information about that a little bit later on. There are various ways in which the community here has been recognized. Um, these are just some of the awards that have been won by the, by the community or acknowledgments of the quality of the standard of service and welcoming that is offered here in the community. One of the principles that Peter spoke to regularly um, in the early days was the notion of simplicity and beauty. And those are values that hopefully continue to be reflected in what it is that you see when you come to the foundation. This is the door to the Universal Hall. It's the main entryway. And this is our performing arts building. There is a recording studio. There used to be a photography studio. It's where our IT people live. There's a professionally equipped uh, drama dance studio and a huge auditorium that seats um, 350 people for lectures and performances. Our community center has been extended several times although the kitchen is pretty much as Peter first designed it way back when. This is a shot of the living machine which is the sewage treatment that I was telling you about that works with these tanks, work with different complexities of ecosystems, each tank becoming a little bit more complex and it's a way of clearing and cleaning the water rather than sending it off to the local sewage plant. And of course humor needs to continue <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis here. We have uh, with so many people coming from so many places around the world, all of whom are involved in a personal and spiritual development process. There's an ongoing journey of discovery and deepening. There are, of course, lots of things to worry about. The New Findhorn Association is um, an organization once the foundation and community grew to a kind of equal size and now actually the, the wider community is much larger than the foundation itself. And the new Findhorn Community Association is a structure that coordinates the activities and the different needs and contributions of all of these different organizations. And they fall into some main categories. This is by no means a complete list of everything that is there, everything that is here, but it get, might give you some idea of the diversity that one can find here. I would like to um, go back a little bit to hopefully the photographs that you've just seen 
have given you some sense. I, I am a firm believer that words are very in our compare words compared to pictures are rather inadequate and that photographs often carry an energy and they give you a sense of what it is that is being spoken about but I would like to go back a little bit into the story because I'd like to make the connection to the name of this particular talk the founders of our community, of this community, were not intending to start a community. In fact, they often have said over the years that if they knew that that's what was ahead of them, they might have run screaming from the site. Their, their journeys are told in their, their auto, in their biographies and those are very widely available but it really is quite a remarkable tale of synchronicity of faith of making that inner connection to the divine source and then becoming very allowing that connection to become the center Peter would often talk about living life with God at the center and because Eileen and Dorothy had very clear inner guidance, very clear inner direction, and had become very attentive to following and implementing that guidance. They had 10 years of practice doing that before they arrived at the Findhorn Bay Caravan Park and the adventure that was the creation of the Findhorn community began. By the time they arrived here, they had a deep trust in one another. They had a deep commitment to service. They had a profound connection and trust in their own inner sources. So those three, those principles, those attitudes were very, very much a part of the foundations that were laid in the first cycle of the development of the community because they were not able to find jobs and because they were trying to start a garden literally on sand with a few pebbles and a bit of heather thrown in when Dorothy was told in her morning meditations that she had a job to do with nature that she had um, that everything in nature was intelligent whether it was a stone or a star everything had an intelligence and that she should align herself and find ways to engage with that intelligence. Her first response was something along the lines of don't be ridiculous, vegetables don't have brains, how can they have intelligence? But having had 10 years of training in following that inner direction and trusting it, she knew that she would come back to it and indeed she did. And it was through coming back to that that she made the connection with what she then called the devas. Deva is a Sanskrit word, means being, being of light or shining one. And it was a word that she wanted to use to describe this formless energy field that she could engage with and that she could interact with. She didn't want to call them angels. Angels are full of, full of form harps and halos and wings and such not and that wasn't how she experienced this stream of intelligence that she was engaging with through a meditative state over the next few years she encountered devas of many different kinds of forms of life and the messages that she received uh, fall, fell into two main categories one, one category would have been very practical advice how far apart to plant the plants how many rows to plant whether in the sun in the shade how to make compost how to apply compost and the other kind were kind of more inspirational where qualities were discussed or the nature of the relationship between the human kingdom and these other subtle worlds was 
discussed. One consistent message was that it was vital for we human beings to recognize the power and potential we have as spiritual beings, that this relationship with the subtle worlds, particularly with the intelligence within nature, was a key and crucial aspect of responding to what would be coming in the future, that it was a co-creative relationship, it was a partnership, it was not one of subservience. They were not looking for blind servants, they were looking for partners. And this is the exploration that then became a day-to-day -day part of the living as the gardens were created, as food was grown, as relationships were evolved over time in the beginning. It was really the garden that created the initial interest in the community, in what was going on here. People would hear little whispers, they'd come to visit, they'd like what they found, and they would stay. Mostly that meant they either rented caravans or they uh, purchased caravans and brought them to the site. Some people purchased the bungalows that were built. The bungalows were erected because Eileen had guidance that that's what needed to happen, even though there was nobody to live in them at the time they were ordered. So there were all these leaps of faith that came from this inner source. And all the while, they were being encouraged to continue with their network of light meditations, to send love to the planet, to see the planet being filled with light, to act as planetary servers. And indeed, by the time I arrived in the community in the late 70s, Peter was referring to the community as a school for planetary servers. The idea being that you came here, you lived here for a while, you learned the lessons that you needed to learn, you had your rough edges polished off, you had your uh, ego challenges confronted, and you learned how to serve. And then you went home, or you went back out into the world, and you served where you could in the ways that were appropriate for you and for your particular talents and skills. The idea of uh, a school for planetary servers then found its counterpart in this notion of the mystery school, a place where people could be drawn from around the world who could, through what it was that they needed to learn, be the best possible teachers for others. And so this idea of we are all students and we are all teachers is also intrinsic to the attitude to life that goes on here. But it's a, an attitude of how we do that in day-to-day -day life. How do we do that while we brush our teeth? while we do the dishes, while we dig the garden? How do we do that while we take the kids to school, while we meet the guests, while we wash the tables or clean the toilets or respond to a gazillion emails? How do we do that while we ba balance the figures in our accounts office? So it's a very applied spirituality. It's a very practical spirituality that is active in an ideal world 24-7. But of course we're human with all the frailties and flaws that that can bring about. So life is not perfect here by any means. People come often expecting to find some form of utopia and of course that's not what they find what they find is a place that doesn't really look so so different from the rest of the world. There are cars and screaming kids, there are televisions and gadgets, um, there are all the 
indications of modern life. But when you scratch below the surface, what you find is those things are shared, or it's not everybody has to have one because we can share together, or we have a carpool system, or we have a commuter bus. We have commuter buses that run between the two campuses several times a day. So there's all these ways in which that value of wanting to work co-creatively with nature, of wanting to live lightly on the planet, of wanting to see everything as an expression of living spirit. Not only the animate around us, the plants and the trees and all of that, but all of the inanimate as well. Seeing the inanimate also as an expression, an embodiment, a manifestation, an incarnation of spirit. So if you came here, you would notice that our buses have names. You would notice when you go in the kitchen that the large appliances have names. The bungalows have names. We try to engage with what is around us as an expression of a living presence. And as such, that, that object, that person, that landscape is deserving of respect. It is deserving of loving, caring attention. And there's an attempt and I use the word advisedly because, you know, sometimes we forget and sometimes we don't try hard enough for long enough. But there is this constant returning to this idea of co-creation. How do we work with the forces of life? How do we pay attention to the, the information, the wisdom, the perspectives, the knowledge that is held in the non-human, non-physical realms. David Spangler often uses this phrase, second ecology, that there is the subtle world represents a second ecology on this living earth, and that that ecology is every bit as complex, every bit as abundant, every bit as um, diverse as this ecology that we're more familiar with through our senses and through our sciences. And these two ecologies overlap constantly. So how do we bridge the gap? How do we walk? How do we as human beings, as evolving spiritual beings, how do we walk the borderlands between these two environments? How do we create partnerships between the inhabitants of these two environments? How do we set up systems that allow for consultation with the constituents of this other ecology? These are questions that we work with on a fairly regular basis. We do not have the answers. We have some. We've found some things that work we found some things that didn't work. But this is the inquiry that is at the heart of the Findhorn community. In so doing, in pursuing that, in pursuing our interconnections, in pursuing living lightly on the planet, in pursuing building houses that um, have low footprints. In trying to do all of these things that um, honor the earth, really I think what we're trying to do is create Gaian citizens. What does it mean to live locally, act locally, be concerned and engaged locally, and yet at the same time stay alert to the challenges that are facing the planet? stay alert to the creative response to some of those challenges or the creative contribution that we as a community can make or we as individuals can make to these ongoing global challenges. How do we 
prepare ourselves to be global citizens, to consider Gaia as a, as a living, sentient, intelligent consciousness. It's not just a scientific biosphere. It's not just uh, the accumulated synchronicities of biology, but that it is a living conscious presence with which we can ultimately engage if we fully allow ourselves to question our own capacities, if we allow ourselves to fully engage with the sovereign spiritual essence that each one of us is. So what I've talked a lot about is the, the, the way we have evolved the story of what has happened at Fintorn over the years and what we're working with now. In many ways, the founding of the community, those principles, although they're now more than 50 years old, I personally believe that they are essential threads in a new story for humanity, in a new story for how we move through the rest of this century, how we could potentially have a future that goes beyond the 22nd century. And this new story, this idea of a new story, how we frame that, how we shape it, what is it going to be? How do we find the threads of this new story? This is the uh, theme of a conference that will be happening in September. It's not really a conference, it's called a special event. And uh, it's a gathering that's going to happen here at Findhorn. The um, registration is already full but we are also working with new stories here in the sense of making participation in this upcoming event a truly global possibility. So hubs are being set up around the world, Things are there will be webinars, there will be um, online sessions that you can hook into, there will be blogs, there will be the whole delightfully technological nine yards, as they say. And I think that uh, Alexander may be posting at this point a link to the New Story Summit pages on the Findhorn website. There are so many things that I could talk about because Findhorn really is a very diverse place and it's a um, it's a greenhouse in some ways. The new ideas are birthing here all the time. Some of them play out, some of them don't. And I really have no, I would much rather spend the rest of the time looking at uh, responding to any questions that you might have, any comments that you might have. I would rather be guided by what you would like to know about than what I think you might wish to know about. Thank you, Judy. Um, in the usually now webinars, we have certain structure for questions, but this time the the flow of your presentation was so smooth and inspiring that like I didn't dare to interrupt your presentation. <laughs> oh, okay. Everything you were saying was so to the, the the point which for myself like the key words for that was the vertical and horizontal alignment and i think that's like uh -huh. summarized so beautifully the essence of the finhorn community and yeah i definitely would like now to open the floor for the questions and uh, okay please uh those in the audience bring your uh not just questions, but comments and inspiration. Oh, please, sharing, yes. Uh, yes. On this topic of the living Earth and Gaian citizenship, and like, unfortunately, we have very little time left for uh, for that this segment of sharing. But please use the chat a section of your control panel, or raise your hand icon on the control panel, uh, and I will unmute. 
as as as, as you see, everyone but Judy is muted on the uh, webinar for technical reasons, but you will be unmuted on your request. So please. And as, uh, in the chat window, you can see already the link to their new story summit that Judy just mentioned. And so far, there is first question coming from Diane Adams. Are there animals residing okay. in Findhorn? Are there what? Are there animals Are there residing animals at Finhorn? Uh, absolutely. Um, there are uh, lots of cats and the ecosystem, one of the things that I've enjoyed while I've been here is watching the ecosystem build itself. When I first arrived there were almost no birds, and there were no other kind of like small creatures and whatever, and now we have a very thriving ecosystem. Um, we keep chickens and on the park more and more people are actually um, getting into small animal husbandry. We tried working with sheep but that didn't work so well. There are people who keep horses. Um, we definitely have flocks of chickens and more recently we have started to bring in a species of guinea fowl as a biological response to the fact that we have ticks and Lyme's disease here and apparently guinea fowl like to eat such things and so we're experimenting with that. We also have deer who come in out of the local forest and um, rather enjoy the delicatessen that our gardens represent. So sometimes there's a bit of tension between the humans and the deer. There are um, rabbits and pheasants and uh, hares on the on the dunes just behind the park. So yes, I would say we have animals. <laughs> I would say we do. Another question from Judy Link Wong. Can anyone learn to contact and work with nature spirits? Or does one have to be gifted with special abilities? Are any of these skills taught at Fithorn? Absolutely anybody can learn to do it. Um, we all have the capacity to do it. Some of us have a, um, a leaning or a tendency in that direction, but it is our firm belief, my firm belief, that we all have the capacity. It's part of our spiritual inheritance and it's part of our makeup as human beings. It can be taught, it can be learned. The principles are very simple the practice of it however sometimes takes time and it certainly takes um, consistency and dedication. It is taught here at Findhorn. There are various workshops that go into um, teaching the, the tools, the, the skill sets and there are people from Findhorn who also travel around the world and give workshops around such subjects, myself included. Today we have very, very practical questions. Uh, I think it's a, we can attribute to the the topic itself <laughs> and the, the energy of the Virgo uh, full moon. So another uh, question from Vicky Sutter: uh, Do you, do your bees have colony collapse disorder? If <laughs> not, do you have training for international beekeepers? If yes, please name the company. Uh, uh no, unfortunately, we d we have experienced colony collapse here. Um, not we haven't lost all of our colonies, but each winter in the last three winters, we have lost some of our colonies. We are also repopulating our beehives um, from natural swarms, and so we're hoping that that will allow us to you know just up the step up the resistance that the hives are having and we are planting more wildflowers and people are becoming much more attentive to what they need to do to help support um, the bees. But no, we do have the problem. We have not been exempt from it, unfortunately. I have a question of my own. Uh, okay. How Besides those uh, things that you named in your presentation, like uh, 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 how do you 
support financially the community how like all through throughout this 50 uh, years yes. is it just labor of community members on the ground or is there anything else the um, the prime source of income within the Finthorn Foundation. The Finthorn Foundation is an educational charity and it's the trust that runs most of the educational programs that happen here and it owns a, a substantial proportion of the various buildings and grounds that, that would have been in the slideshow. That income from the conferences and the edu ed educational programs probably pr is the biggest percentage of our income but there are lots of businesses that are also part of the community independent businesses there's a printing press um, design businesses lots of craftspeople lots of uh, alternative health practitioners uh, consultants of various sorts there's a several other charitable organizations that are part of the community all of whom employ people as well as generating um, income there's a caravan park business there's a shop there's several cafes there's a bakery um, <laughs> there's a solar panel production company um, one of the oldest the oldest in Scotland one of the first in the UK to produce solar panels there's a whole variety of um, businesses, whether they're small or large, that are part of how people sustain themselves financially. Within the foundation, uh, we have a staff group who receive room and board and a small and a small annual monthly allowance. About a third of the staff of the foundation are non-residential, so they live outside the foundation and receive a slightly higher cash allow cash salary per month as a result of living non-residential. So it's a very it's a very healthy economy. It's a very diverse economy, but within the foundation, um, certainly none of us are. There's a saying, none of us are doing it for the money. <laughs> the, the salary levels are very low and the differentials between the highest and the lowest paid is very, very small. We deliberately work as much as possible to keep everybody on the same staff salary levels regardless of what job they occupy within the organization. I don't know if that, does that answer the question enough? Um, yes, yes, I think that's an uh, yes, yes, important question uh, for many people because, many people, because at least from my experience, the idea of, uh, of community living has been in the air for years, if not for decades, uh, yes. but very few who would really make this attempt that it would happen and it's always the question of practicality yes it's all great but how yeah. we make this spiritual living practical so it's yes, it's yes. well we work quite hard <laughs> I also have to say we we do receive uh, some grants and obviously donations from supporters um, but our operating basically we cover our own operating costs year after year after year and uh, some of our buildings have been donated. A lot of it was built. The Universal Hall, for instance, which was in the slides, was basically built over a period of 10 years by people who were part of the community. So it's uh, a labor of love in many ways, what you see physically when you come here. The love of the people who have lived and worked here over the last 52 years. There's another question uh, from uh, Vicky Seta. Uh, is there a way how to be in touch with uh, you or the, some people in the community? You mentioned the loads of emails coming, but what is the way to communicate with uh, the community? 
Um, there's a number of different ways, depending on what it is that you would like information about or what area of the, the community you would like to be in touch with. I think the best bet is to actually go to the Findhorn website um, and there you will www.findhorn.org and there you will find links to other parts of the community. You, there's much more information about the history. Um, and probably a lot of your questions can, can get answered from somewhere on the website. Those that can't, you can send to inquiries at finthorn.org and the people in our visitor center will do their best to answer your questions. Um, we have another question, um, Judy. It's coming okay. from Nancy. And she's asking, uh, Judy, you mentioned that there are conflicts. Are there any unusual sources you can identify, or is it just human nature? Oh, it's just, oh, it's plain, just plain old human nature. Yeah. yeah. We, have we have all the same kinds of uh, challenges, challenges that I think they have, that you'd have, have anywhere when you get a large number of people, very, very broad, broad spectrum of nationality. So, so we also, we also have all the cultural differences, differences or the challenges of trying to communicate across cultural differences. We have, we have challenges that are created by not, not everybody is native English speaker, but English is the working language in the community. In the community. And then, you, and have then you have all the other challenges that are just part of, part of human nature. When people get, people together, get together with other people, it seems, it seems like we create, create a challenge of one sort or another, and sometimes it escalates, escalates to conflict. conflict. But, we have, but we have very clear procedures, procedures for trying to work that with that. We also, we also have something called, called the Common Ground document. document. Which is, which is a, 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 set, a set of 14, 14 State statements of principle that we try to live live by. And within, that, within that, there are very, very clear, clear guidelines, guidelines around if you have trouble, if you have trouble with somebody, you go and talk, talk to them. <laughs> and if, and and if that doesn't work, then you go and talk to somebody else. If that doesn't work, doesn't work then you go and you talk to the other person with somebody, person with somebody else, else, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that there's a, there's a, there are commitments to giving and receiving feedback. Commitments to being willing to engage with the issues, the issues and topics that are creating conflict in, in our community. community. And then there are and systems, systems, systems makers, 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 facilitators, facilitators so, that, so that hopefully, hopefully things don't have don't to escalate, escalate and that we and can catch the and work, and work it through, through, through earlier, earlier rather than later. 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 But people, but people are people. Are people. <laughs> you know, you know, so, so, so of course it's here too. Here too. Now, I don't I don't think that I think one I think of the one fallacies, fallacies about Finn Horn is that it's, that it's perhaps it's some, it's kind, some of kind of utopia. utopia. It's some it's kind some of kind of place where, where everything, everything is perfect, is perfect. and, and um, you know the fairies, you know, the fairies are dancing as toadstools under the trees. The, trees. the reality the is, is um, if it's if going it's on going out there in the world, world, then in then some, degree, some degree, to some degree, degree it's going it's on at Finn Horn. All the challenges, all of the dilemmas, all of the issues that are in our world are at Finhorn too. And I think that's part of how we serve. We try to find ways through some of these challenges so they don't become the kinds of conflicts and issues that they can become in other places in the world. So we, we look at, if I can work through it here, in my own little world, in my relationships with the people around me, then I am contributing to that being less of a problem in the world as a whole. And then, of course, hopefully, there's other kinds of inner work that we also do that contributes to alleviating some of the tensions on the planet. Uh, there has been some uh, sound problem some static uh, sound in the microphone. I'm not sure oh, what okay. is that, so I apologize for that. Um, Judy, maybe you can try to mute yourself and, and unmute. Maybe we will solve that. Um, yes, Judy? So we'll see if, is that any better? Yeah, it's Did somehow take better. take the problem it, away? 
yeah, there's some a little of static, but yeah, I think it's better now. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sorry was, about that. People were saying That's that okay. they, they couldn't hear uh, part of what you were saying. Oh, okay. It was maybe, breaking up. Yeah, maybe you can just repeat like briefly, like summarize your answer. It was, <laughs> <laughs> sorry for that. Oh, let's see. Okay, so. Um, About the conflict and the, the reasons. Right. So we have um, we have a document called the Common Ground, and it's a series of statements of principle and intentionality around how we operate together. So of course there is conflict here. Wherever there are human beings, there are conflict. It seems to be part of what we do. And we have a lot of very complex um, sets of relationships here because we're living together and we're working together and we're pursuing a spiritual path together and we're trying to do our personal development together. So um, life can get rather complicated and there are rough edges and conflict happens. We have facilitators, we have peacemakers, we have procedures for trying to deal with that. And basically, um, Findhorn is not a utopia. It's not this kind of wonderful place where everything is perfect. Um, it's full of human beings, different cultures, different ages, different spiritual backgrounds, different traditions, and all of that can lead to friction. Um, the reality is if there are challenges that are, are being faced in the world around money or sex or religion or conflict or um, all of the things that are in the world are also at Fintor. We are a microcosm. Hopefully how we are trying to work with it is what is different and the reasons we try to work with it those ways is different. This is my hope. Thank you. And I would say that's the hope for <laughs> many, many of us because in a way you're <laughs> forerunners and you do it for all of us. Well, we make a lot of mistakes but hopefully we learn from them. Um, the time is now very, comes close for for us to have a meditation and mm -hmm. I just want to ask the very final question if you could just say a few words about what is the ways that people could join this new story summit you, you mentioned that there would be international hubs set up for the many online events if you go to the new stories uh, page on the Findhorn website There are uh, links to the New Story Hub and, how, and uh, information about how to create or if you're interested in creating a hub in your part of the world or you may find out that there already is a hub. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Okay. That's, that's the, the place to get the, the full lowdown on, on, on it all. Mm-hmm. There's also going to be a Facebook page and a, hopefully a YouTube channel and so there'll be lots of avenues into participation if people really would like to do that. We would like to make it a global event. And what a are truly the dates? global event. The dates are September the 27th to October the 3rd. Great. Thank you. And Judy, if I understood correctly, there's ways for people to connect online for the first three days. Yes, and then, there uh, is. to create their own um, summit after that. Yes, exactly. So we'll have little mini sub mini sub summits happening all over the place. Like a TED model, basically. Like a TED. Yeah, I suppose you. Uh, yeah, similarly. Yes, yeah, similarly. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. So I suggest we now move into meditation, and just as a like. Okay. It, technical precaution if this starts the sound the static sounds would start to appear I will ask you to mute your microphone and unmute again it seems helped the last time but I hope it will be okay. fine during meditation all Thank right you. and can you just give me a time check on how much how much time we have remaining or what people are 
anticipating have, being done by? We have 15 minutes. Okay, all right. Great. So I would invite you, wherever you are, to simply take a moment to let all the words that have been spoken settle. And in accordance with your own personal practice, to allow yourself to settle into that deep silence, that deep peace that resides within you. And in this place, this silent source place, I invite you to engage with the generative source within yourself, your own spiritual engine, as it were. And allow yourself to generate a field of love and light and wisdom, a field that enfolds you and gently emanates out to bless the space around you. And as you inhabit that field of love and light and wisdom, let's take a moment to consciously acknowledge and welcome the beings of the subtle worlds that interact constantly, that engage with us, in the creation of life, the guides, the guardians, the teachers. That hold us and hold this living earth, our planet, in their care, in their keeping. as we acknowledge these inhabitants of the subtle worlds, we enter into partnership with them. Consciously generating waves of love, waves of caring, waves of gratitude, in collaboration with these subtle world beings, we consciously bless our world. all the peoples. All the nation states.
all the creatures of earth and air and water. We bless with our love and our care the creatures the plants Let us spend and send a very special blessing to the waters of the earth. This element that is the lifeblood of the being of Gaia. this element that circulates and regulates and brings life. Let us bless the air, the atmosphere of this blue and white planet. This thin envelope that sustains and makes life possible. And then I invite you to hold in your mind's eye an image of our planet as it is seen from space. This blue and white marble. And imagine that you and your companions, both human and non-human, are extending blessings to Gaia itself. Extending gratitude to the conscious living presence And as that gratitude ripples out, imagine the network of servers, those who seek to serve the light, 
those who seek to serve the emergence of a higher consciousness on our world. See that network shining like a fine spider's web all across the planet. Illumined, shining, potent. Then in your own time, in your own way, allow your attention to focus on your body, in a chair, in a room, returning gently to your vehicle in this world, in this life. And as a final piece, remember to give thanks to and to bless yourself for your contribution, for your service, for your love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for all your co-workers. We've been working for all these 50 years, preparing the way. Indeed. I will pass on the thanks. <laughs> And as we prepare for the peak of the full moon, we will keep this alignment created today, this meeting, holding this vision of the global network of light. And we will keep it till the next full moon and further. And uh, I invite you to join our, our next uh, webinar on the Libra Solar Festival. It will be with Dot Maver from the United States, and we will talk on the topic of restorative justice. Mm. And Dot will share with us the experience of working the uh, in uh, Riverdale in Florida, uh, creating restorative justice system, which now is spreading all over United States and many states already taking this program as re replacement for punishment justice. So mm. 
link us next full moon to meditate on the topic of law and justice. Thank you. Wonderful. And Thank please you. send uh, your feedback of this webinar and your sharings and comments, and we will pass them to Judy and to the folks in the Feedhorn community. Have a wonderful rest of the day.